Hi, hello and welcome to this session. Thanks, Rashan. Um, I don't have any PowerPoint presentations and so, so those who are looking for a very erudite discussion and you know, full of uh, <coughs> complicated economic theories and all will be very disappointed. Uh, I'll just have a little chat, maybe uh, 20, 25 minutes. It's now 12, uh, 11.59. And then I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you may have, totally about 40 odd minutes or so. 45 minutes at best. Uh, I have been asked to discuss about um, India in the next five years. Uh, before that, let's let's look back, uh, not five years, but just about a year back, August 2013. Where were we, and where are we now? Now, August 2013, exactly a year back, our current account deficit was uh, more than four percent of our. Uh, economy and uh, gross domestic product GDP, which is the highest ever India has ever witnessed. In 1991, when we open up the economy <coughs> uh, under the biggest ever balance of payment crisis, our current account deficit was lower than this. So very high current account deficit, the highest ever. Of course, high fiscal deficit you had. You had rupee slipping against the dollar every day. In fact, sometime, I think in the last week of August in 2013, rupee hit the all-time low against dollar, some 68 plus. Forex reserves, because Reserve Bank of India was selling dollars to protect the rupee, Forex reserves dropped dramatically. It's about 275 billion. And then there were the <clears throat> very high inflation. Our retail inflation, which Reserve Bank of India tracks, or the consumer price inflation was close to 10% in August. And uh, WPI, which is uh, wholesale inflation, which Reserve Bank of India does, is not concerned too much about, uh, its main focus is CPI. And WPI was about 7%. So that was the situation. What about market? Market actually, in August 2013, market dropped 3.75%. And it was somewhere at 18,000 plus, that was the sunset. So the combinations of all these macroeconomic parameters were not at all good, they were all pretty lousy. India was under the threat of being downgraded. So that was the situation one year back. Where are we now? Look at all these specific macroeconomic parameters. Current account deficit is much, much lower. It's about 2.7% of GDP, which is almost half or little less than half of what we had seen one year back. Rupee stabilized, which was slipping every day and hit all time low of 68 against a dollar, actually uh, revived to about 58. Now in the past few days or a week or so because of the geopolitical prices, etc., it's I think 61 plus, but average it's about 60 thing and all. So it's, it's remarkable recovery from where it was. Foreign exchange assets, it's more than 300 billion, I think close to 320 billion. Inflation, CPI has actually come down from close to 10 to 7.31, retail inflation. I'm talking about June, last number, which is available. July number is not yet available. And wholesale inflation is even lower at 5.43. And nobody is talking about rating out, uh, downgrade anymore. So there is a dramatic change uh, in the macroeconomic scenario, what India had witnessed one year back in August uh, 2013 and to this point in August 2014. On every parameter you see, whether it's current account deficit, whether it's uh, fiscal deficit, whether it's movement of the currency, whether it's stock market, inflation, on each and every parameter, we are, we are much better off at this point of time. Now, what has changed in the past one year? What is this? Why is this? And nobody, as I said, nobody is talking about uh, rating downgrade anymore. So, what has changed in uh, in the past two years? What has prompted those changes? There are two changes have happened. One is Reserve Bank of India has got a new governor, Dr. Subbarao, who had a five-year stint at uh, Reserve Bank, stepped down, I think, on 4th September 2013. And we have got a new governor who was the former chief uh, <coughs> economist of IMF and also had one year stint with the government as its economic advisor called Dr. Raghuram Rajan. He stepped in in the first week of September 2013. So we have changed the governor and of course we have changed 
of government. We had the Congress-led UPA government in the past 10 years. Now, uh, it was defeated in the last elections, and we have got a new government, BJP-led NDA. Now, first let's talk about uh, what does it mean, the change of governor of Reserve Bank of India. Subarao, who took over at a very critical time in September 2008, you know, at the, when, the, when the world, uh, just in a, in a week or 10 days after he took over, uh, we witnessed the worst ever global crisis, financial sector crisis, in the, uh, following the collapse of Lehman Brothers. It happened in 14, uh, I think 14 September 2008. 13, just about 10 days after Subarab took over. And what happened after that, the entire credit, credit market across the globe crashed. Uh, there was a huge liquidity crisis, and everybody was started talking about as if there would be no tomorrow at all. It was the worst ever since the 1930s Great Depression. So at this point of time, so what Subarab did, Subarab and the government, they joined hand together, they, they pumped in lots of lots and tons and tons of money. They cut interest rate as if there was no tomorrow. So every day there was a rate cut and so on and so forth. And we came back from the brink of a crisis. In fact, India had uh, much, much, uh, I would say, uh, you know, it's only one quarter we had seen the economy was plunging before 5%, uh, while the rest of the world was suffering from depression for a much longer time. India managed it well because of our rural consumption story and because of a very alert finance ministry and Reserve Bank of India. We were not, uh, we didn't suffer long from that crisis. But what happened because of that, uh, we also sowed the seeds of high inflation, which we had been seeing in the past five years. So there was a lot of money that got into the system. And when economy started looking up, what uh, Subbarao did, he, what he famously said that he's taking baby steps. So he was very aggressive in cutting rates, but while raising rates, he was very tentative because he was not very sure whether by raising rates, whether he would end up killing the fledgling signs of economic recovery. So he was very slow in raising rates. So in the process, what we found that uh, we, 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 high inflation. We created inflation because there was a lot of money in the system. And he was very slow to reacting. The only way, on the, the classical way of containing inflation that you need to tighten the monetary policy, uh, you need to raise your rates, you need to suck out liquidity from the system, so on and so forth. But he was very tentative because he was not very sure whether if he tightened the rates, if he, if he tightened the money, money supply and raise rates, whether it would um, affect the economic growth. And of course, there was a conflict between the finance ministry. As you, as you know that always the government is pro-growth and Reserve Bank of India is more for price stability and growth. So there is inevitable conflict. So what happened in the, in the, in fact, if you remember the famous utterance of Chidambaram in August 2013, just before um, Chidam, just before Subbarao left, his last policy, he was under tremendous pressure from the government to cut rates, but he refused to do so. So after the policy, Chidambaram made that famous remark that the finance ministry will have to walk down the growth path alone. There is nobody to support. So that was the scenario. And he stepped down on 4th September and completion of five years. Now, what is the legacy of um, Subarao? One is very high inflation. Second is very high current account deficit. There's a weak rupee. Um, all sorts of things. And of course, uh, economy was not growing at a rate. It's already uh, dropped below 5%. Uh, in retrospect, everybody thought that Subarao, and he himself admitted, perhaps he could have been more bold, he could have been bolder in raising rates, and perhaps he could have uh, bought rupee from the system. He allowed the rupee to, uh, you know, to get overvalued, and so that we saw that, which actually leading to the sharp correction. Between, between March 2010 and July 2011, rupee was actually trading at 14.44, around 44 and a half and so. So there's enough opportunity for Reserve Bank of India to buy rupee, which he did not do. So that act, he actually allowed the rupee to get strengthened, and then suddenly by July, August, he found that rupee was falling apart. So that was the situation. 
Now, Rajan took over on 4th September. What did he do? He, on the, on the very first day, he said that inflation is enemy number one. We need to kill inflation. If we are looking for growth, sustainable growth, we can't afford to have a high inflation. So that's point number one he made it. He also said that we had nothing much to do with WPI because WPI, that's a wholesale inflation, does not reflect the real scenario. So target the CPI, consumer price inflation, the retail inflation. And he instituted a committee which, is, uh, which, is, which, which was headed by his deputy Urjit Patel which had said that Reserve Bank of India must target inflation, and it has given a sort of glide path for inflation where we should see inflation. Uh, going by that, inflation, the WPI, infl uh, sorry, the CPI inflation or the retail inflation should be 8% by January 2015 and 6% by January 2016. And Reserve Bank of India is sticking to that. It says, look, come what may, we have to follow this path if we want to bring back the economy on a sustainable growth path. Ever since he has taken over, Rajan has hiked interest rates that thrice, and in the last three occasions he has left rates unchanged, even though inflation is coming down. For instance, uh, retail inflation in la less than 8% at the last count, still, which is less than 8%, meaning he has already reached the target, which is uh, slated for January 2015. But despite that, Rajan is not willing to cut rates because he says, look, we will not end at January 2015 target. We need to achieve the January 2016 target, which is 6%. And he is not convinced that inflation trajectory you know, is on the right path, and indeed we will get 6%. So till such time he is convinced that inflation genie is bottled, he would not cut rates. So at this point of time in August 2014, if we want to look forward to the next five years, what's going to happen, there are two very critical numbers we need to focus on. What are the two critical numbers? One numbers, one set of numbers is the inflation number. Inflation, 8% January 2015 and 6% January 2016. On this entire trajectory depends on our monetary policy. If we are able to achieve that, if we are on the right kind of trajectory, then only we'll see a red card, otherwise not. And as you know, the red card will help corporate India, will help demand growth, so on and so forth, will help growth. But unless we achieve this two pair of, this pair of numbers, that is 8% by January 2015, which is achievable, people say, and 6% January 2016, which is pretty difficult at this point of time, unless we achieve that, Let's not talk about rate cut at all, even though there's a clamor for corporate India that we should cut rates. That's one set of numbers we need to be really clued on. Other set of number is what Arun Jetli in his uh, budget speech has mentioned. 4%, 4.1% fiscal deficit this year, 3.5% for next year, and 3% by 2017. So even though you know there is a there is a there is an act called uh, FRBM Fiscal Responsibility Act, which by and uh, which actually stipulated that we need to bring down our fiscal deficit to three percent and so on and so forth, but after this Lehman crisis, at that point of time, finance ministry said that we we were we were shelving it for the time being. It has not yet been revived, but in for, even though this Fiscal Responsibility Act or FRBM has not yet been revived. But Arun Jaitley made it clear, and he said that he has created a roadmap for fiscal deficit, which is 4% uh, for the 4.1% this fiscal year, 3.5% is the 2000, uh, next year, and 3% is 2017. So these are the two critical numbers we need to look for what's going to happen in the next five years. Now the three very critical things that we need to look at how we need to, uh, if we need to assess India's uh, growth prospects, uh, uh, India's story in the next five years is this. One is the administrative or the legislative efficiency of the government. You know, in the past government was voted out purely because of the policy paralysis, the inefficiency part. It never took any decisions. If you see there are hundreds and hundreds of long and projects which involved tons of money could never get clearance because of uh, so many other issues like land issues, like labor issues, like uh, uh, so on and so forth. So administrative uh, inefficiency, that was killing the government. 
and we, we, we faced a stalemate. So the three key things, as I said, two sets of numbers we need to look at what's going to happen for us in the next five years, and the three key things which will actually hold our future. One is the administrative and the legislative efficiency, which is clearance of all the projects and land reforms and labor reform, so on and so forth. Uh, there are hundreds of big ticket projects which is worth 250 crore each have been stuck. They're worth about seven trillion. And there are other projects worth about three trillion. So 10 trillion worth of projects have been stuck. The banking systems have given some money, but they're not been pushing because of the lack of clearances at various levels. You know, power um, uh, plants have not been taken off because the coal linkages have not been cleared, so on and so forth. Chidambaram, to be honest, he tried his best in the past two years. You know, he held meetings at various sectors in various parts of the country with bankers on the one side of the table and the corporate guys on the other side. He tried his best, but nothing happened. So about 10 trillion worth, rupees 10 trillion, 10 lakh crore worth of projects have been stuck. Only if we bring administrative efficiency and you know, get the, all the clearance done, these projects can, can get the right kind of push. And that will hold the key to our economic growth. That's point number one. Point number two is this, uh, what we must look for is the nature of government spending. Is basically, do you spend in, uh, for, on subsidies or do you spend on capital investments? So what do you do? In the past few years, ever since, ever since, uh, ever since the Lehman crisis happened, the government focused on subsidies. In fact, subsidies as a percentage of GDP has been growing, whether, while the capital in, uh, expenditure as a percentage of GDP has been falling. So we need to see, one is the administrative efficiency, and second is the nature of government spending. Would this government shift from subsidies or payer subsidy drastically and focus on capital investment? And third and most critical part is the inflation control. Now, inflation control can only happen when both Reserve Bank of India and Finance Ministry join hand in hands. RBI alone through its monetary policy cannot control inflation, certain things. So the government needs to step in, the governments need to take a, a look at the, at the various, you know, that Commodities Act, uh, which is basically a state government rules, etc. Et it, it needs to clear the supply side bottlenecks, it needs to take a relook at the minimum support prices for commodities, so on and so forth. So it has to be a collective, collaborative efforts by the government and the finance ministry to contain the inflation. Only then, as I said, 8% inflation, it's achievable by January 2015. 6% inflation by January 2016, is it achievable? It seems very difficult, but it, is, it will be achievable if RBI gets the right kind of support from the government. So the monetary authority cannot do it alone. It's both the fiscal authority and the monetary authority to work hand in hand. And if that happens, and if indeed, if we see that uh, inflation is going down at 6% in January 2016, then Reserve Bank of India will be encouraged. Not that he needs to wait till January 2016. In before that, if it gets the sense that in the right trajectory, RBI will be encouraged to start cutting rates. And if we cut rates, as you say that, you know, that will be good for corporate India, that will be good for consumer demand, and so on and so forth. So budget, uh, in some sense, you know, um, has not promised much, but you have to see, give that the, that the finance minister was new. It had only six weeks to prepare the budget and all. So there is no firm commitment, what a what lot of people expected. On the on the on the subsidies and uh, you know uh, on on uh, food be on other things like uh, your GST and uh, uh, direct tax code there, there are a lot of expectations from the budget but the budget has not done much but that does not necessarily mean that uh, the government will not do anything because for everything you don't need to uh, go through the budget you have seen what happened to the railway budget railway budget did say nothing but before the railway budget actually the uh, fare hike and the and the freight freight rate hike happened so government does not necessarily need to do everything we need to we need not wait for the next budget to things happen things can happen faster now Overall, you know, in our conversation with finance ministry and, uh, sorry, not finance ministry, in the, in the corporate India and uh, um, various kind of relevant people and the policy makers and all, what we find is this, everybody is talking about now what India will follow is what will we call it, the Gujarat model, uh, where bureaucracy 
plays a very critical role. It was all the way, uh, they, they, they project uh, Narendra Modi more of a CEO of a company or the CEO of a country at this point of time, not, uh, not a prime minister. Uh, and what happened in Gujarat, again, he played the role of a CEO and nobody knew which, act, nobody bothered much about which ministry is headed by whom. It's the bureaucracy which worked, worked for Gujarat, for everything, the first clearance and for everything. Now, the key challenge is this, uh, can you replicate the Gujarat model for India? Because India is not, Gujarat is much, much bigger and in terms of every diversity and so on and so forth. So can you do that? And if you, if you want to do that, bureaucracy would need to play a very critical role uh, because the ministers are new, uh, they are inexperienced, they have the right kind of uh, intention to do, but they need to be supported by the bureaucracy. And we have a bureaucracy which is not, you know, which is uh, apathetic or very lethargic to actually efficiency. You know, they are only, uh, you know, they are used to just uh, sign on the file and to look at it later. So they are not known for uh, their aggressiveness and do things faster or not. So I was told by, there was a meeting happened in Delhi on you know highway projects and all, which was chaired by Nitin Gadkari. Uh, it happened about uh, three weeks back and there were, you know, when Nitin Gadkari was saying that every day we need to uh, see this X kilometer of highways uh, being done, so on and so forth. Um, uh, and he, he wanted to be very progressive and very aggressive actually on the infrastructure front. Then apparently one of the corporate guys, and I will not name the person, he stood up, he's, he's not a very big big corporate house, but he's one of those who was involved in building highways. He said, sir, uh, you, it's all, everything is fine, but you know, our, my money, which is stuck about three years back, some few hundred crores, I have never got it. Uh, I worked on that, I completed my project on the right time. Within 24 hours, it happened post-lunch meeting. Next day by the morning, uh, in, he got the check he got it got his payment clearance so here is a minister who actually means business but what i was telling you is uh, and this is the way uh, this new ministry um, is trying to work uh, the entire thing it's very alert very aggressive and push things faster but will it happen uh, in order to uh, this happen uh, you need to have uh, very 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 alert uh, bureaucracy, which I am not very sure whether we'll have or not. Overall, uh, I'll just take five more minutes, then we'll end. Overall, uh, whatever the anecdotal evidence we see from, uh, from various quarters, from corporate India and the policy makers and all, the feeling is uh, next five years will be very critical for us. We are in the cusp of a very big change. And the next five years will be more critical, more significant, and I would say a seminal five years than what we had seen in the early 90s. Uh, there are many of you who is much younger than me. Uh, for, for, and you know, but even we who have crossed 50, we kept on talking about uh, 1991 or the early 90s when India opened up the economic, uh, on the economy under the burden of. Uh, uh, worst ever uh, balance of payment crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a landmark milestone uh, year for us, 1991, and e economy got opened up at that point of time. So what we see in India because of that. But collective sense that we get from various uh, stakeholders in society and the large part of the country and overseas foreign, and even overseas from foreign investors, what our feeling is this, we are an observer or commentator, that next five years between now and 2020 or so will be even far more impactful than what we had seen in 19, early 1991. Because there is a government which means business, uh, which uh, I'm not, I don't have any political affiliations to any political parties or anything like that. But the sense is this, we have got a set of doers at, at the government. So the, the policy paralysis which we had seen uh, in the past five years or so, it's now a thing of the past. Uh, is we, we have got a set of ministers who are well-meaning, who want to push things in the right direction. Uh, we have got a very aggressive uh, Reserve Bank of India governor who, who means business. And there is no uh, conflict between the ministry on Reserve Bank of India on what to do. Both of them, I was in a meeting um, in AIMA uh, conference, um, award giving for conference, did a study in Delhi, what happened when, where our Home Minister 
spoke and the first thing he said is this, we'll not be able to cut interest rate one unless the inflation comes down. So which means the government and Reserve Bank of India have been talking on the, uh, you know, they are on the same board, they're talking from the same platform. It's not a question that government wants RBI to cut rates and RBI says no. So it, there is a complete um, consensus among the two that the rate should go down. So we are, I think, in the cusp of uh, making history. India will be, uh, at this point of time, is Asia's third largest economy, and even the world's third largest economy, if you, if you consider it in terms of purchasing power parity. But uh, the way forward in the next five years is going to be very critical, as I said, it's very seminal. Uh, and if that needs to happen, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that that will happen, there are a few things that we need to watch out on the financial sector, because you, as you know, that it's, 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 it's very critical, financial sector plays a very critical role um, in, in the economic growth. What are the few things that we need to look at? One is, of course, the, the issue of the bank capital. You know, our banks are capital starved. The Reserve Bank of India internal note says that between now and 2019, when the Basel III norms uh, kick in, our banking se segment, which is the public sector banks, they need seven trillion worth of capital. Now, where will the money come from? Nobody has the kind of answer. This budget did not give any answer. Um, Arun Jaitley said that banks will uh, raise money from the market by offering shares through retail investors, but it's, it's very vague. We really don't know. So the government needs to find out uh, how to meet the uh, capital requirement. Second is this, uh, the bank's problem of piling bad assets. Between bad assets and restructured assets is about 10% plus of Indian, total Indian banking assets. So it will play a very critical role um, uh, if we need to clean up the banking system and if you really need to have, because you know, when, when we had seen 27%, 28%, 30% credit growth of the banking system in, two, in 2006, 2007, those years when economy was actually growing at 9.5%. That credit growth, economic growth has dropped to five, less than 5%, 4.5%. And credit growth has dropped to uh, about 14% or so. So if you need to have the right kind of economic growth, you need to have a credit growth. And if you need to have a credit growth, the banks will be in a position to support the growth with adequate capital. They don't need to have the capital. And banks can actually support the growth if they, if they are well capitalized and if their books are relatively clean, they have le less NPAs, they don't need to set aside more money for their bad assets. So there are two critical things that you need to look at it's uh, the, the rising, the piling of bad assets by the banking industry and their lack of capital. And the third, of course, is you need to have a public sector banking reforms. You have seen, uh, it, was, it hit the headlines, I think last Sunday, one, one, and the CEO of the chairman of one public sector bank got caught taking bribes. So the corruption is a big issue. Uh, the banking boards are inefficient. Uh, they, are, they, don't, they, they, they don't play a critical role in strategizing things and all. So you need to also have uh, banking sector reforms. Uh, because as, if only if you have the reforms and if you can put the, you know, streamline the banking segment, then you will see their market value will going up and then you will see they will be, they'll be able to um, raise money from the market. So these are the three critical issues as far as the financial sector is concerned which is the uh, public sector banking reforms in public sector banks. Second is their higher NPS, how to tackle them. And third is their capital requirement. Because you need to have a very strong, resilient, and stable banking system if you want to have a proper kind of economic growth. So from, June 2000, from the June quarter of 2012, for the last eight quarter, we have seen the GDP has grown less than a 5%. Uh, around four and four, barring, barring one quarter, which is September 2013, 5.2%. But otherwise, it's, it has grown you know, always less than 5%. Less than we need to bring back the growth, not 9%, because it's unless you have uh, large-scale reforms, uh, fiscal reforms, you will not gain back, but at least 7% growth. It's, it's, it's going to happen provided we address those issues, the issues of, as I said, in the financial sector and the issues of inflation. So in sum, we have a very complex economy. We had gone through a very bad patch, but it looks like overall what we feel is uh, the worst is over. Things are behind us. It will not, overnight it will, things will not change, but we have a competent financial sector regulator. We have a competent market regulator. We have an aggressive ministry which wants to, wants the, uh, to change things. 
So, and they are all on the same boat. There is no conflict. Uh, we need to have a possibly more aggressive, not a sleepy bureaucracy, but a more aggressive uh, bureaucracy, which can uh, you know, support the right kind, the minister, minister's aspirations, which had happened in Gujarat, which needs to happen in the Indian context. So overall, I think we are pretty hopeful. Next five years, as I said, will be, will be very seminal as far as the Indian economy is concerned. We are in the cusp of creating history. I think all of you, uh, the young India, I mean, uh, of the youth wing in CII, for you, it will be an extremely eventful five years, uh, which, as I said, which will be more significant in the econ Indian economic history than we, what we had seen in the early 90s. Uh, it's a bright future awaits us. Uh, I'm not a marketing man, so I'm not selling India here at all. That's, that's my observation from talking to policy. I'm not an economist either. But while traveling and talking to policymakers, talking to foreign investors, uh, talking to ministries, talking to regulators, and talking to corporate India, that's the sense I get. I am convinced that uh, next five years will be extremely difficult, different, and extremely critical, and things will get better. With that note, I, I end, and uh, Rasham, it's all for you for questions. Not, I, I'm Shall I sure. go there? Or? Yes, of course. Ah, Please, fine. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.